Versus what are we calling it? Like the living soil crew, or you know, food soil web, the, the soil food web crew, and kind of how they're begrudgingly coming to at least acknowledge or accept that there's something interesting with kind of the KNF world, whereas initially they dismissed it. Mm -hmm. And so, can you kind of talk about? What maybe like what KNF is, why the soil food web people maybe initially kind of poo pooed it, and then kind of how they're bridging that gap and maybe coming to accept or even eventually become enthusiasts? Yeah, so basically, what we're seeing that um, one of the things that we talk about in these groups, especially groups of regenerative farmers, because we really do see a divide between you know, the Korean natural farming and the, you know, food soil web biological protocols. And so in that divide, like, how do we come together and how do we acknowledge that both methods work and where does that misinformation and misunderstanding happen? And what we're realizing is that a lot of the people who followed a lot of Elaine Ingham's work, she's very much um, a staunch proponent of making sure that your inputs are what you think that they are and making sure that things don't go anaerobic because anaerobic is generally bad and generally you get pathogenic things happening and it's, uh, it can quickly become a problem. So when you talk with people who you know kind of believe in that mentality, what they're thinking is that Korean natural farming is a ferment and since it's not an aerated situation, it's going anaerobic and therefore anaerobics are bad. But when you talk to the Korean natural farming and you start getting into this, you see that it's not really an anaerobic process. It's open to the air, you have breathable lids, there's a ferment going on, so there's you know, things happening inside with gas exchanges. And um, I think that as time goes on and more and more people are going down this methodology with Korean natural farming because it's so cool and it's so effective and it's just a really fun process to get into, they're saying, well, this works really well and plants aren't dying, and there aren't pathogens, so there must be something to it, actually. And uh, for me, I have my microscope, so when I'm making my indigenous microorganism collections, I'm actually looking at it under the scope so that I do know what I'm putting in there. Uh, my opinion is, you know, you can go just as easily really wrong with a compost tea as you can with your rotten rice. If you don't know what your basis of your microorganisms are that are in there, doesn't really matter which method you do. You could blow it on either side. You can do things different ways and still have it work out and still have it be beneficial, just maybe not exactly how you thought of it originally. Can you talk kind of with each methodology, what could go wrong and, and what, like, what are you actually seeing under the microscope? Like when, when someone messes up the KNF process, can, can you tell me which microbes are showing up to the party? I actually can't tell you which microbes because the microbes are still so small that even with our shadow microscopes that we're using, we, we don't know which ones they are necessarily. Um, but I have definitely had inoculations of bad fungi. Like they're clearer, they're thinner, they don't have a uniformity to them. Um, they don't have these septums that separate them. So what you want with your beneficial fungi is like a big, fat mycelium that's dark in color, has little walls basically in between them and is uniform throughout the whole thing and of a large size. So if I have that, I know that I'm pretty good to go. Um, learning other things that can be pathogenic, like what a fusarium spore looks like is a really good one to know. So if you see tons of those, you know you have a problem. Um, if you end up with a ton of ciliates swimming around, that's usually not a very good indicator. That's an indicator of an anaerobic condition. Uh, and that's more on the compost tea side that we see that rather than on Korean natural farming. And yeah, I mean, with most of the ferments that we're making, I mean, it just looks like, you know, happy bubbly things. So it's funny, as you mentioned ciliates, and I remember the first time I, uh, you know, looked at stuff under the microscope and I saw these microbes whizzing around and they looked so <laughs> cool and I was so proud of them and I filmed it and I put it up on YouTube and people were like, yeah, those That's are the bad not ones. Good. <laughs> those are, those are an indication of an anaerobic environment. And I was like, ah, oh. yeah. 
So. Yeah, I think my first flagellate I found, I followed it for like half an hour. I got the I, worst kink in my neck. I was like, this is so cool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but flagellates are good. You just talked about kind of after you go through the KNF process, what you're looking for under the microscope mm -hmm. to see if, if you did well or poorly. In, in like brewing teas, um, which is a, an aerobic activity, uh, what are you looking for under the microscope in terms of I'm going to put this on my plants or not? So f when I'm doing my compost teas, I'm looking for something different because we use a lot of our own earthworm castings. So ideally what I want there is I want some of those um, larger microorganisms. So I want some testate amoeba in there. I would love to see a nematode, but those usually aren't in the compost tea. But you know, if you're there in the compost or if they're in your soil, like that's a really good sign as long as it's a, you know, bacteria eating or I've never seen the omnivorous uh, nematodes. I've only seen the bacteria feeders. And I don't think I've ever seen a root feeder, which is really good, says something that we're doing something right with our composting process and our, um, our earthworm castings. But definitely looking for those testate amoeba, still looking for the beneficial fungi. And then there's a way to do your counts where you're counting how many microbes in each slide and you're figuring out what your, you know, colon forming, col colony forming unit CFUs are, things like that. Um, I usually don't go that deep into it because, you know, if I see my fungi and I see my amoeba, I'm, I'm a happy camper. So if I think of these two processes, um, when you're making compost teas, do you kind of have different brews for different stages of plant growth? Like maybe you'll do more fungal dominant in the early stages and, uh, you know, progressively move towards more bacterial dominant and then certain specific bacteria maybe at the end that are known pathogen fighters. And then with KNF, is it kind of, are, are you dialing things in the same way that you do with teas? I actually dial it more with, <clears throat> with KNF than I do with the teas. Okay. So the teas, I, I want it fungally dominant always if I can get it there. Uh, we know that cannabis really responds well to like a, up to a 30 to one fungal to bacterial ratio. So that's a really, really great thing to, to see is make sure that you have that fungi in there all the time. Um, and then with compost teas, a lot of that we temper it with, you know, like a little more heavy on the nitrogen side, like green grasses or something like that. Um, or we'll add some fish amino acids or um, fish hydrolysate. At not, we won't brew that into it, but we'll add it in when we're using it for our drenches. And then with KNF, you get, it's, it's more, so Korean natural farming is traditionally a foliar method. It's not meant to be a soil drench. You have your indigenous microorganisms, you inoculate the soil with those, but all of your ferments that you're making are just for foliar. So it's a little bit different because what we're finding is that cannabis, it doesn't quite have the same nutrient cycling that like a tomato does. So tomatoes go through some very distinctive phases. It goes through flower, it goes through, you know, vegetative, and then it puts on flowers and it puts on fruits and then it dies. But with cannabis, we don't ever really let it do the fruiting part because we want it to be sensimia, so we're not pollinating it. So you just see it's got, it's got a different kind of rhythm to it. Um, especially when it comes to what we're using and when we're using it. So we're finding that, and a lot of us have found different things, you know, some of us like to continue spraying some of our sprays further into flower. Some of us like to do it, you know, end it later. Uh, one of our, one of the farmers that we speak with does, turns it into a drench at the end. So he stops foliar feeding and starts drenching the soil instead, um, which, I've done also, when I started Korean natural farming, I didn't know it was a foliar. So I was using it as a soil drench, which worked really well, but as a foliar, it works much better. And a lot of that has to do with when you're using your seawater, your water soluble calcium and your water soluble calcium phosphate. Normally they're used at very specific times, but we're finding with cannabis, you kind of have to tweak it a little bit more and really read what your plant wants. And because it's a foliar, it picks it up and responds very quickly. So does that imply that you kind of have a mixed process of K and F on the leaves and sort of tea brews in the soil or what, what's your that's process? what Yeah, that's what we did a lot of last year. Um, we did have one area of our garden that was strictly K and F uh, and then the rest of it, we kind of did a mishmash of the two. 
And so this year we're actually really excited. We've got our 8,000 square foot at full term outdoor garden. That's gonna be separated into eight to 10 different cultivars. Each one will have 10 to 12 plants. And we're gonna split it right down the, into thirds. One third is gonna be strictly Korean natural farming. So we'll do indigenous microorganisms on the soil. We'll do a liquid indigenous microorganism um, extract at a few different times during the cycle. Uh, and then Korean natural farming implements for the, all the foliar. The other far side, we're going to do a strict food soil web system. So we're going to use compost, compost teas, um, some fulvic acid uh, as a foliar after the compost tea. And I believe that's going to be about it on that one. And then in the middle, we're going to do both. So I'm going to use indigenous microorganisms and compost tea and compost tea extract and liquid IMO for the, f for the soil. And then for the foliar, we'll do a combination also of the compost tea and the KNF. And we'll just kind of peg it out through the year and see what happens at the end. You, you've already gone through a season with KNF, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and can you give us kind of a, a can you distinguish between like pre-KNF and post-KNF in terms like what have you looked for or noticed? Have you had a more bountiful harvest, more terpenes, less pathogens? What, what's, what are you looking for and, and what's happened as a result of, of adopting KNF methods? Um, we've definitely seen higher resin production. Okay. So we were, I've, I've been very impressed by just the overall quantity of the resin is way higher than we've seen it in the past which I was really fairly surprised about, actually. So Frenchie can only would be very happy. Yes, Frenchie would be, <laughs> Frenchie's gonna love k &F when he gets into he, it, it'll be awesome. He could destroy those trichomes. <laughs> um, La destruction des trichomes. <laughs> Everything for the hash. <laughs> um, so lots more trichome production. Healthier plants overall, they were just easier. They just seemed to be more resistant to kind of everything. Uh, we did have thrips last year, which was the first time. And I'm, I'm sure I manifested it on accident because <laughs> I heard thrips were coming back to cannabis and I was like, thrips? We haven't seen thrips in cannabis since like the 80s. That's crazy. <laughs> well, so that was going to be my question. Is that something that was unique to you or was that endemic to kind of humble overall? To the cannabis industry overall, like thrips kind of hit everyone last year a little bit more than, um, you know, than, than we expected or than I've seen in a really long time. And uh, I happen to know Suzanne Wainwright, who's one of the lead entomologists for the United States for horticulture. Most, she used to be in like hanging baskets and cut flower industry. And as she sees more of how much cannabis really needs some help with their integrated pest management plans and um, you know IPM strategies, she's come into this space. And so I actually, you know, caught these little thrips and put them in this little vial and sent them off to her. And it's a brand new species of thrips that is all over the West Coast. Well, <laughs> and I don't know if it's a thrip specifically, but I remember there was something that was unleashed somewhere north of you now you're shaking your head but you know the story i'm telling I right do. like to, to 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 combat something else yeah but, but is that a false kind it, of it's a really bad rumor it's okay. this is this is one of those rumors that just makes me cringe a little bit because it got so widespread and it took me maybe 10 minutes of googling to find the information so what it is is that caltrans workers created this biological assay to combat star thistle and tumbleweed and oh, yeah. there were Sorry. yeah there were two different predator um not predator there were two different pests that they released and one of them was a type of mite but it was a grecian uh, gall mite i believe or a grecian blister mite i can't quite remember exactly what it was totally different species totally different you know very very different animal altogether and uh, somebody found out about that and went, oh my gosh, Caltrans released mites. And that's basically where that whole thing came from. But it's not the same mite. The hemp russet mite is very specific to cannabis. It doesn't go to other plants. So people worry about like, oh, it's going to go to my tomatoes and live on my tomatoes and I'll never get rid of it. And then it'll, you know, move back and forth. It doesn't actually work that way. Hemp russet mites, very much a hemp 
russet mite. It's a cannabis enthusiast. <laughs> exactly. Okay. It's a proud cannabis enthusiast right. that does not like vegetables. Well, okay. So, so it seems like thrips hit everyone. Yeah. Nobody was spared. How did, like when you were talking to other cultivators who weren't using some of the methodologies that you were using, kind of what was the the comparison and the damage done or the plant's rigorous defense against the pests? Yeah, I mean, that is the interesting thing that I hadn't really thought about too much. Most people with their thrips, it, it damaged the plants pretty bad. I mean, we had them pretty bad. It was, they were like, you know, it was not hard to find some to put in a, a little jar, but we don't really like spraying pesticides or anything. And we were getting close to the end of the run. So we were just like, well, you know, we'll just kind of, I don't know, wash them down with water and, you know, try and mitigate and manage them a little bit. But the interesting thing is the end result flower was still really good. I mean, we still had really great nutrient uptake. The plants didn't really suffer at all. I mean, unless you got up close, you couldn't really even tell that there was that much of a problem. And we did do a lot of predatory releases. We released Aureus, which is a, um, a minute pirate bug is what it's called. And so that's a predator. We released a predatory wasp and then we released the minute pirate bug, um, both to kind of help us combat them. And it, it, it took down the population. It made it manageable, but um, it didn't, again, it didn't seem to impact the plants terribly detrimentally. So, so your main strategy was predatory bugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, did you have any friends who had other strategies that were effective or? People still kind of like to pretend like things happen that didn't. So like I know a friend that was like, oh, we totally got rid of our thrips like by, I think they use Dr. Zymes or something. And I was like, that's awesome. And then when I looked at, you know, one of the leaves, I'm all, no, you didn't. <laughs> like. So it's almost like everybody's feels shame yeah. or something and yeah. doesn't want to just come out and say, <laughs> we all got it. Yeah. I, I have no shame. I'm like, people are like, oh, have you ever dealt with russets? I'm like, oh yeah, plenty of times. Of course. I mean, anytime you bring a plant onto your property, you're probably bringing russets in. But the great thing is if you deal with them once, generally that's all it takes to get really good on your quarantine process. Right. And then after that, you're like, oh, whatever. Russets aren't a big deal. Spider mites, psh, easy to take care of. What was the movie, The Sharks and the, like from the 70s? The uh, West Side Story? Yeah. Two gangs in the West Side Story or the Bloods and the Crips or any, the right. Celtics and the Lakers uh, being from Boston. Uh, what would you say to kind of the living soil or the soil food web camp to, to get them to give KNF a chance? Like what, what are some of the, the compelling arguments? Um, you know, it's really, there's, I, I actually just spoke with somebody at one of our regenerative conferences. Because point being two years or how many years ago did you do zero KNF? And, oh yeah, like three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Was. So it, it's only been three years for you. So talk about the and, and, finding Jesus. <laughs> and I will be honest, like when I first heard about it, I was like Korean natural farming, but we're not in Korea. Like we're using rice to collect our indigenous microorganisms, but we don't have rice. Like we don't grow rice. Um, and then I'm like, well, actually California does grow rice. But, <laughs> um, but at the beginning I was kind of like, I don't know about this. This seems like pretty bizarre to me. And what turned for me was we went out to the beach and I collected a bunch of seaweed and I was talking with my friend Layton who's a scientist on the east coast and I was like okay so I have all this seaweed like I'm kind of thinking should I dry it out and like pulverize it and like how much work do I really want to do on this maybe I'll just dump it into compost should I feed it to my earthworms I don't know what do you think Layton and he's like you know what you should do you should ferment it and it was like Oh boy, are you going down the rabbit hole too? He's like, I am. I've gone down the KNF rabbit hole. I'm going deep. It's pretty interesting actually. Like, why don't you just, just try it? Just give it a shot. See what happens. So I took the seaweed that we had, which was a bladder rack and it was the weirdest thing. And I loved it. It turned into this, like when you poured it, it was like thick yeasty cake batter almost. And it was like kind of thick slimy and gooey and it was just so fun to play with and by the time the ferment was done I was like okay if this is this much fun like if this is this cool I have to learn more about it 
and um, and then just started using it and. For me, I really like the fact that these are all inputs that are made for our human body as well. So as soon as I started getting into that and I made our first er um, Oriental Herbal Nutrient or OHN and started taking that internally, I was like, man, this stuff is gold. This, we do not, my family doesn't get sick anymore. I have a four-year-old and an eight-year-old and I guarantee you they're swimming in germs. The only one who got a cold in the last two years pretty much has been my four-year-old who doesn't like the OHN and myself when I was on vacation and forgot to bring it with me and I knew I, that my kids were sick and I was like, oh man. But you know, it's just like, wow, if this, if this can help the human body this much against pathogens and diseases and things, like it's gotta be good for our plants. And so just you know, started using it pretty minimally at the beginning. And again, like I said, when I first started, I didn't know it was a full year, so I was like, you know, making a big, huge vat with a, had some FPJ and some OHN and a little bit of, um, God, what was I putting in at the time? Brown rice vinegar. And I didn't have recipes. I was just kind of going off what people were saying online. So I was just kind of Well, like that's what I was going to ask next is what, what was kind of your original recipe and then kind of what's the iterative improvement of that? Yeah, the, I don't think I even had an original recipe, honestly. I was just like, you know, how much do we put in, guys? People are like, I don't know, try this much. And we're like, okay. Oh, and LAB, that was the other one. Actually, LAB was our first, first foray into KNF. So that's um, lactic acid bacteria serum. So you're basically taking milk and you're letting it kind of ferment and turn into curds and whey. And then you take the curds off and you're left with this beautiful LAB that is just phenomenal. I mean, like we had a micronutrient deficiency. Um, God, I think that's what it was at some point. There was something going on and that was all we had made because that was the first thing I tried. And I was like, this was easy. Like, let's do this more. And my husband was like, well, what do we do with it now? And I'm like, I don't know. What do we do with it, people? And people were like, I don't know, water it in. And we're like, okay. <laughs> so we did. And within two days, we saw that micronutrient deficiency just disappear. And I still like, I mean, you know, I'm going from memory from a couple of years back, so I don't know for certain what exactly else was happening, but I was just like, okay, this is cool. And so then playing with things, finally last year, I went to Boise, Idaho and studied under Chris Trump. And that was where everything started really making sense because you leave there with this beautiful sheet of recipes and you leave with all this intrinsic knowledge about how to use each recipe and when to use it and in what ratios. And it's like, okay, how do you make fermented seawater and why do you want to do that and what do you use it for? And um, so then getting to come back and really start implementing that and doing it the right way and then having a background in growing cannabis and knowing how to see nutrient deficiencies and be like, oh, I have the input for that. That's going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So we'll kind of, you know, there's some blending of recipes that does happen now just because I've done it enough where I know like, okay, this, I know this needs potassium and I know that water soluble calcium or phosphate, phosphate, pardon me. And I know that WCAP is our phosphate for this. So I know that I'm going to add that, but we're not in this particular stage of development. So we're going to add it to this one instead. Um, and then I also love doing side-by-sides. So that's been really eye-opening this year as well. We did our seed soak treatment and I did um, the same seeds, same cultivar, started them in the same soils, the whole nine yards. And I did the SES, which is our maintenance solution or a seed soak treatment. I did plain water. And then a few years back, I'd soaked in a fulvic acid solution and it worked really well. I got really much faster germination, a better germination rate. So I was like, well, if SES is good and fulvic acid was good, I should add them together and then it'll be like gangbusters. Absolutely incorrect. I, absolutely incorrect. I was shocked. We got the worst germination rate, worse than plain water, and the plants did not grow as fast. Right now, I've got some pictures up on our Instagram that shows you can see this was SES and this is SES and fulvic. The ones that we had just the straight Korean natural farming, darker green, they don't have any leaf drop showing. They're not picking up any micronutrient deficiencies. The ones that had fulvic acid added, and this is months ago, months ago. They've been treated the same ever since. The micronutrient deficiencies, lighter green, it's having a harder time with uptaking nitrogen. The bottoms of the leaves are yellowing and falling off. I mean, it's, it's just like, I was like, wow, this is so cool to actually see this and you know do a side by side and really know that like, 
it's been developed a certain way and it's probably perfect the way it is for the most part. Yeah, what do you, what do you call that in pharmaceuticals? They're like contraindications or something yes. like that. Like these two drugs should not should be Should not together. be together, yeah. yeah. And we found it, it was um, even worse for our loofah sponges. So the loofah sponges was an 85% germination rate. I think, yeah, I think it was 85% is what we ended with, with the SES. And they started germinating within like 24 hours. Loofah sponges can take to up to three months for these seeds to germinate. I was like, whoa, this is really fast. Uh, the plain water, we had, I think, 80% germination rate, but they were, last I measured, they were a good two and a half inches shorter in average height than the SES. And the SES and Fulvic, we had a 40% germination rate, and they just kind of like <laughs> grew up and fell over. I was like, okay, <laughs> good to know. That was, that was not a wise choice. <laughs> FPJ, I think, is a really good one for people to start with. It's really easy. It's pretty hard to mess up. FPJ is fermented plant juice. Okay. So basically, the only difficulty with that one is that you're supposed to be up in the morning before the sun touches your plants. And you want to just take the growing tips of your plants, not the whole plant, not the roots. Uh, if you go off information online or in old books, there's all kinds of different ways to do it that are not the right way. And one of the first ones I made had like the roots and it was like, knock the soil off, but you know, gently, it's okay if it's in there. And it turns out that no, that's not really a good idea. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like I said, we do our FPJs with seaweed. So that has this whole different profile than like the growing mustard tips from the you know wild mustard that's in our yard. A lot of people do FPJs out of aloe vera. So there's just, you know, it's just, it's so widely diverse and it's so easy to do. It's a great one for people to start getting into, but you never spray FPJ alone. So you always have to at least add your OHN, which is your Oriental Herbal Nutrient, and that's a tincture. So you have angelica, garlic, ginger, cinnamon, and licorice. And you ferment it first with either sugar or sugar and beer, and then you do a tincture and you stir it every day for three months and uh, do different, five different extractions. And at the end, you end up with this really amazing nutrient solution that's um, really healthy for you and it's really healthy for the plants. And when you add it to your FPJ, it just creates this beautiful microbial colonies on your plants that make it extremely resistant to pests and diseases. And are you applying a consistent concoction throughout the life cycle or like the, the, what was the first one? FPJ, o FP OHN. FPJ and mm -hmm. OHN. You basically create those two solutions, you mix them, and then that's kind of your foliar spray for the entire process? Or are you adding other things at certain points? Yeah, you like, can use that. That's, that's the maintenance spray. So it's brown rice vinegar, OHN, and FPJ. Your FPJ is a one to, let's see, FPJ is one to 500, I think. And then OHN is 1 to 1,000, and brown rice vinegar is 1 to 1,000. So you're using very, very minute amounts of this. Maintenance spray you can use up to once a week, anytime, doesn't matter. But what you really want to do is dial into your life cycle and the nutrient cycling of the plant. So if you're at the beginning in the vegetative stage, then you want to add some other things to it. So FAA, which is your fish amino acid, so that takes about three to six months at least to make. So a lot of these are processes that, you know, you have to really start them. And this is also foliar. Foliar, yep. Okay. Yep. And so you want to start some of these way ahead of time. In a pinch, we've used fish hydrolysate instead of FAA because we didn't have it. But, um, and then you have your water-soluble calcium, and you have a water-soluble calcium phosphate, and those are used at different times too. So you have your maintenance solution, good to go anytime. You have a vegetative growth solution. You have a you know, flowering or uh, finishing fruiting solution. You have a changeover solution. So that's generally used, like if you were doing light deprivation or an indoor, you'd use that during your transition phase, which is usually about a week before your light cycle changes and a week into it. Um, and then you also, there's a, a ripening formula, a ripening enhancement formula that we've just kind of started playing with and tinkering with a little bit and seeing how to use it and when to use it and, um, and you know what, what the effects does. are right. yeah and <laughs> right. what the effects are because that's the key so that's when those control groups really come into play like if you put it on everything you don't really know what worked and what didn't because you put it on everything but if i know that this plant got it and this plant didn't 
or this section did and this section didn't, and I have that control group, I can come back and really say, listen, this isn't subjective. This isn't me thinking that this has a better terpene profile or that this was more pest resistant. This is me actually having data to prove it. And I think that the cannabis industry has a, has a very difficult time collecting some relevant data because we get excited about things and we just go you know, hog wild and do it on everything and we forget about the fact that we now really don't, don't have anything to show that it actually did what we think it did. So um, I, I'm a big proponent of like at least, just at least, you know, a few of them, leave them alone and see what happens and make sure that it is doing what it's, you know, what you think it's doing. It seems like nutrients are, there's nutrient intake through the leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Which is why KNF is so cool for cannabis because it is so responsive. Like you really, you do really see changes in a day or two minimum if you're doing, if you're doing it right. And if you're doing it wrong, you'll see that pretty quickly too, which is nice because then you can bounce back and be like, okay, fix it with that. Whoops. That was so, so you could, I mean, as an example, just to test things out, you could have like soil that's deficient in some critical nutrient and you're providing these foliar sprays where the plant will, the leaves won't turn yellow. It, the plant's like, I'm still cool. Yeah. Like I may not be getting it through the roots. I'm getting the suppository or something. Like I'm not getting it through the <laughs> mouth. I'm getting the suppository, but it's still. It's still doing its job. Right? <laughs> and then Korean natural farming also does implement a living soil. Very much so. Indigenous microorganisms is like the base of it. So without that, you, you have a harder time. I mean, we did one in... Um, I think I had a little isolated bed that didn't have, you know, the soil wasn't great. It was, there, there's one, the ends of one of our beds is just always lacking. I still can't figure out what's going on down there. But those ones, even with the Korean natural farming, they were lacking. So um, we're going to do a better inoculation with our indigenous microorganisms this year and see if that doesn't snap that area out of it. But you usually are using these, you know, mycelial mats. Uh, to, to keep your soils up to health and to keep that fungally dominant as well. And what do you, are you growing in like raised beds or pots or in the ground or? All of the above. No, okay. no pots, no pots. We don't do pots anymore. Okay. So we have raised beds. Um, we have mounded. They're not like, Kugel. you know, Hugel, Hugel culture. Yeah, Hugel. Yes, I my actually, German mother would pronounce it correctly, but. I love my, I have my Hugel beds at home. Yeah. And, um, oh my gosh. The water usage on that is insanely small. Like I was shocked. I watered it one third of the time compared to the rest of my garden. I was just like absolutely mind blown. It's, it's so cool. And just the fungal dominance of it. I mean, I can like dig a sample of soil out and get it under my microscope and immediately find beneficial fungi. It's oh, just sure. Like you basically easy. have rotting logs and yep. dank environment and yeah. Yeah. So, so with, with the raised beds, are, are you like, what, what's kind of the typical dimension of a raised bed? Oh gosh, everybody does it differently. Ours happen to be um, uh, four feet by 80 feet. Okay. Three feet by 80 feet. And, and, four. and so, four so, by 80. so basically what you're doing there is you're, and, and so in that 80 feet, how many plants are you getting? Well, our, well, it, it depends. Um, I think that we, depends on the size. So, you know, generally our light depth, we're using clones and we're planting them every foot to foot and a half. And we have, I think, two rows that go down the bed. And uh, I know that in the entire 5,000 square foot garden, we run 960 plants. Okay. And that's in uh, one, two, that's in eight different beds. But I, I guess where I'm going is, is the idea here that like a lot of people historically have done pots where each plant's root system is isolated, right. but you kind of want every, all the root systems to be partying together and with the microbes and the fung, you know, the fungal, just everything together, not like pot one, its own right. ecosystem, pot two, its own ecosystem, like silo, siloed ecosystems. You want kind of everything. And then I guess with, with like, your like drip irrigation are using like blue mat or anything like that to kind of keep sort of the the uh, moisture level consistent like are you using tensiometers or anything to, to like so 
do you, do you get scenarios where like, you know, the, the warmer, sunnier side of the greenhouse maybe is drier in, in the soil than like the far end of the greenhouse that's maybe cooler and, and less light? So our, um, our in, light- in, in that 180 right, foot raised that, bed. Right, so our light deprivation is actually open air. We don't have it enclosed. So there is no greenhouse effect happening. Um, we don't tend to see that much of a difference in, I mean, we do have drip tape irrigation, but it's just on a timer. And, uh, you know, we hand water in our, you know, our soil drench of whichever it might be, usually at least once or twice a week. Um, and really just, yeah, I don't see a lot of difference with that. And I mean, I don't know, I'm kind of an old school farmer. People take this, they're like, oh, you gotta pH your water and you gotta get your blue mat on your little thing that measures all that. And I'm like, or you can just talk to your plants and go stick your finger in the dirt and right. find out what's going on. So generally that's kind of what we do is we, we you know watch our plants and we see what they need and we take it as a, you know, as, as part of our interaction with what we do and with what we love to do. And I, I think that makes a difference too. I think it, you know, you, you notice things a lot faster when you're out there. Yeah. You know, if you're assuming that your blue mat's gonna take care of all your watering needs so that you're, you know, doing something else with your time and you're not in your garden, it's really easy to miss those things. And all of a sudden, you know, you see these horrible photos of people with like, like aphids. Like I've seen cannabis covered in aphids and I'm like, how did it get to this point? Like, where did that, how did you not notice you had aphids before they were so, encrusted that like there's just no salvaging that and um, when you're out there you know in your plants with your face you know in the leaves and your fingers in the soil and you're really interacting it's just you, you, you notice things way faster and that's another great thing with the Korean natural farming is you're in there and you're like oh you know I'm this is I got a little bit of a zinc deficiency okay let's see here let's go check out our inputs and you know figure out which one of these might have zinc in it and go do a foliar all right, well, Wendy, I appreciate the time. It is probably like 8.30 at night. And you've been <laughs> on camera all day. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to do a course out of this, right? I mean, not a specific video, but you're going to do a seminar, uh, a six-week, two-hour each week workshop, and we're going to film it and make an online version of it so that people who don't live in Humboldt can... Yeah come enjoy and appreciate it. So I'm excited for that. I'm, I'm really excited to teach people because Professor it's, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's really easy to get bad information online. And uh, you know, having gone through it myself and really made a lot of errors at the beginning because I was trying to figure out how to do things and people say, oh, you, go, you do it like this. And I'm like, okay, and like, no, that's actually, that's totally not right at all. <laughs> well, well may, maybe one day so, Elaine will attend one of the classes. Yes, well, we, we speak. She'll be, she'll be in the front row. She, she will be, and she'll be like, oh, I don't know about this, I don't know. <laughs> and then eventually I'll get her to scope my rice and she'll be like, oh, okay, it looks pretty good. <laughs>